Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am excited to be here with Dave Ratner from Creative Law Network. And we are going to be talking about everything copyright, royalty streams. Uh, We'll get into a little bit of publishing, really understanding all the different rights you have as a musician and how to make sure that you claim all of them. Uh, But before we get into that, I would love to know a little bit about you, Dave, and how you got started in working specifically in in the the area of law, but specifically with musicians and entertainment. Sure. Well, thanks, Bree. I um, I say the the music work started before the law work. So ah. uh, I'm a, I'm a recovering band manager, uh, <laughs> and uh, and before that I was a tour manager, and before that I was a roadie. So I basically I I when I was in my mid twenties, I said, well, I don't play music, but I love music, and I want to work in music. So I. I called up my favorite band at the time and went out on the road with them and kind of learned it uh, literally hauling gear and, and driving the bus and uh, being on the road and, and eventually became their tour manager and eventually became the manager and set up a management agency and was managing bands. And uh, what I really enjoyed about it was being able to help the artists with the business side so the artists could do the art side, right? Artists can make music. Mm-hmm. Managers can run business. But what I realized was every time I got a contract, I need to find a lawyer to read it uh, and realize I could I could do a lot more or do more for my clients as an attorney. So I uh, closed up shop and went to law school and um, with the focus on on helping artists working in the in the creative industries in the music industry. So I started my law firm, Creative Law Network, uh, about a decade ago. And that is what we do. We work with artists and creatives on, on all of this legal stuff. Like you said, revenue streams are a big part of it. Controlling your rights, figuring out where the revenue is coming from. Uh, so we work on contracts and licensing and copyrights and trademarks and uh, everything a, a musician needs uh, or someone in the music industry needs to run, run their business. That is such an interesting path. Most of the time it's like, oh, I went to law school and then I decided that I wanted to niche into this area or I had interest in entertainment law, but you did the opposite, which I think really makes it much, I don't know, we'll feel a kinship, right? Working with you because you've been in the the shoes of the people that you're working with. And you really knew like, what do I need to learn to be up to speed to not have to um, you know, be clueless about these contracts that we need to figure out whether we want to sign or not. So when you were working with bands, were you working with mostly indie bands? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anyone we may yeah. have heard of? Uh, so the band that I, I was tour managing and started managing is a band called the Motet from here in Colorado. Uh, so primarily it, a lot of the bands I worked with were more uh, in the live and jam scene. So basically mm-hmm. a lot of ticket sales, not a lot of album sales back in the day when we used to sell CDs and right. those, those funny things that we remember. Uh, so the, the, I will say one thing that's fascinating is how much the industry has changed uh, just in the time that I, that I made that transition. And I've really enjoyed being able to keep up with it uh, because although I'm not managing anymore, I'm dealing, talking with managers all the time, working with artists all the time, very familiar with those struggles. The, the, the parameters have changed, but the struggles are often the same. And do you end up working with mostly managers or most of the bands that come to you are maybe independent and they don't even, they're not even at the point where they have a manager yet? It varies. Uh, it's both. I mean, I certainly work with a lot of artists who are at that early stage of not really having assembled the team yet. 
the manager, the agent, publicist, et cetera. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes the artist reaches out to me because they've been offered a management agreement. Mm. And that's the first thing we need a lawyer for. They, they've contacted a lawyer about is, hey, before I sign this management contract, I want someone to look at it, which is always a good idea. Right. We don't want to be signing contracts, especially just because contracts are written in that legalese. Mm. Right. With that, 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 that language that can be hard to, to decipher, which is honestly one of the things you learn in law school is how to speak that language. Right. So just deciphering that stuff is one of the main reasons that folks will reach out to us. And even working with an artist who has management, sometimes I'm dealing exclusively with the manager. Sometimes I'm still dealing with the artist a lot because the artist is is more hands on about that stuff. Yeah, that's cool. And sometimes I feel like the the contracts are written that way on purpose, just so the artist like, can't <laughs> understand them, and so then they just get frustrated and they just sign it, or you know, because they yeah. don't want to spend the money to hire a lawyer. Understandable. And for what it's worth, it's not just artist contracts. All mm-hmm. contracts are written that way. So no one is singling out the artist for, for being persecuted by legalese. Uh, but it is, it can be challenging. I, I certainly understand the inclination to say, oh, I don't want a deal. I'm just going to sign this. Uh, but I think it really, it, and it depends on the document. Because for example, if you're signing up for DistroKid or CD Baby, right, you're clicking to agree. When you click to agree, you're signing a contract. Now, there's no negotiating with DistroKid. You, you, know, you can't say, oh, I'd rather have this percentage. <laughs> with your potential manager, your potential publisher or label, there is that opportunity to negotiate. So it's a bit of a different thing depending on the document that, or the contract we're looking at. Yeah, that's a good point. Like you said, there's no negotiating with DistroKid or CD Baby, but you can yeah. choose between them. You can choose, do I want True. TuneCore? Do I, you know? So let's start with the DSPs. Like, mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. you said, when they're clicking, they are signing a contract. So what should they be looking for in that information before they click to agree to help them make the decision of which DSP is better for them? Interesting. So I think that the main thing that I've noticed with the, what the, those distributor contract or those online distributors is the options that you can choose because mm-hmm. you're going to sign up for one of them and they're largely the same. I mean, what I, I think so to answer your question, I think the things we're looking for are the rate, right? What you're going to get paid when you're going to get paid, making sure they're going to put it out to all the DSPs you want it to go to. And what your options are, can you say, I don't want it to go to YouTube, but I do want it to go to Spotify. And then but really where I see clients kind of run into trouble is when they add on. So you add on the publishing agreement on top of it, because I just yes, last week was speaking with a client who signed up for CD Baby Publishing mm-hmm. when they signed up for CD Baby Distribution without even thinking about, oh, wait, I just signed away my publishing rights and how I have to wait a year before I can terminate and those sorts of things. Now, so that's I have where I've different more stories issues. on this. I've had some okay. people tell me that CD Baby publishing is not non-exclusive. And then other people say, oh no, never sign that because then you are going to be stuck if you get a licensing deal or something, then you're going to have to get them to approve it or, you know, because they're going to ah, okay. put your name on your copyright and all that. Yeah, which is so that is understandably confusing. So I think the main function for for a lot of indie artists, I think the most important function uh, for publishing is collecting the revenue, right? Because as individuals, we there's a lot of those publishing revenue streams that we can't collect on our own. We need a publisher or a publishing administrator to collect those funds. So that is one function that that a CD baby can provide. Um, but there are, that does not, their exclusive right to collect is not the same as the exclusive right to exploit. And exploit is the legal term we use for mm-hmm. using the music, licensing the music. I'm so yes, you clarified that because to me, exploit sounds know. bad, right? I know. It's, it's, I can't get out of it, but it is, the exploit is the legal term we use. It does not have the negative connotations it does in, in common <laughs> language. Um, but yeah, it is that you can, uh, it, what's most important about, I think, at that level where you're just trying, where you're signing up for a CD Baby or, or a TuneCore DistroKid 
is making sure someone is collecting your publishing revenue. Um, and that can be, there's a lot of publishing administrators out there, not just the ones through those distributors. So uh, there, there's Song Trust, there's a lot of other ones out there that you can sign up for individually or separate from your distribution. So you do have to have someone collecting that. Yes, you can't you do collect be- yourself. Correct. There are certain things you can collect. And one of the most confusing things about publishing is the various revenue streams that we can be collecting. The a common misconception among, uh, among artists is that signing up for a PRO is all your publishing revenue. Now, PROs are CSAC, BMI, ASCAP, GMR. PRO means performing rights organization. Right. So can if you're right. in Canada, right. Exactly, right. Um, in the US, we're unfortunate enough to have four of them. Most countries only have one. Uh, but yes, your PRO collects for the public performance of your music. That is not all of your publishing. It's one of the revenue streams from publishing. And, and one of the things that's confusing about when we say performing rights, people f- often think, well, performing is, I stood up on stage, I performed my music. <laughs> that's the performing right. It actually is performance anywhere by any means. So radio, internet, you know, if your music is playing over the loudspeaker in a bar off a CD or off the radio, that is a public performance. That's what the PROs are collecting for. They're not collecting for sync. They're not collecting for mechanicals. They're not collecting for print. So there's all these other revenue streams related to your publishing that a PRO has nothing to do with. Also important to remember, the PRO only collects the publishing revenue, not the master revenue. And that's one of the other things people say, oh, well, I released my album. And so if someone's out there, my ASCAP or my PRO is collecting for all those streams Well, they're collecting for the performance of those streams, but only on the publishing side and only for the performance. It's really ridiculous. If you it's very confusing. It is. Let me here's one, here's another common misconception or important point to clarify. So um, obviously, copyright is the kind of legal basis for all these creative works, music, but also film or uh, uh, poetry, uh, visual art. That's all copyright protected. So I often say that copyright can be very confusing. Music copyright is twice as confusing because there's two copyrights in every song. There's a copyright in the composition, the words and music, what you write. When you write a song, you create a composition. But then when you take that composition and you go record it, you create an entirely separate copyright, the sound recording, we often call the master. And so each of those copyrights, they're separate pieces of property, intellectual property, and they have separate revenue streams. They generate revenue separately. So you can go write a song, you're gonna own that composition copyright, which we refer to as the publishing. I can go and record that song. I own the sound recording, I own the master. So you so when I so when my master is performed is played over the radio, it generates performance royalties for you. It also is going to generate revenue for me because it's my master. It's my sound recording that's being used on the other side. Yeah, it's it's, it's insane. So the, and then there's also <laughs> mechanicals, right? Like if you are mm. going to record someone else's song and you're going to distribute it physically or, you know, on through the DSPs, you have Mm -hmm. to pay mechanical royalties to them, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. The notion of a cover. We'll use this example. You wrote a song, I go record it. I owe you a mechanical royalty because I, and the re that, that comes from, I'm, I'm mechanically reproducing your song and whether that is on a physical media, like a CD or a vinyl, or whether it's digital, it still is generating those mechanical royalties, which are also different because uh, mechanicals um, are set by, at least in the US, are statutory, right? They're set by statute by the Copyright Royalty Board. So it's a set amount. There's no negotiation. It's just that I owe you a set amount for every CD I print or every time my, my recording is streamed because you own the composition that I recorded. Right. And that's where people need to go, you know, get, they need to buy some kind of a license they can use, uh, you know, easy song or 
um, you know, Harry Fox or one of those Harry in order Fox, to get yep. those, you know, those mechanicals taken care of before they put it even d- digitally distribute it. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You want to set that up. There is, again, the statute, the, the law provides for how regularly we have to report or pay and how much we have to pay. I think the other thing that's important for musicians is to realize you want to make sure you're collecting your mechanicals because mm-hmm. you, it's, I, this sounds kind of silly, but when you, if you write a song and you record it, you've mechanically reproduced it you upload it to the DSPs, every time they stream it, they are generating mechanical royalties for you. So there's some, there's a new, relatively new thing oh, in yes, the US Oh yes, I wanted to get into this. The MLC, the, MLC, right? yes. the uh-huh. Mechanical Licensing Commission. So this was created by, by law a few years ago. And basically, because what was happening was, you know, you write a song, you record it, it's played online and where are your mechanicals? How are we getting the mechanical money that we used to get by printing CDs that was very measurable? Uh, so the Mechanical Licensing Collective basically collects mechanicals from the DSPs and pays it to the songwriters, to the owners of the publishing rights. And so any songwriter, anyone who is putting their music out in the world uh, can register with the MLC and then when your music is played on a Spotify, Pandora, Tidal, Amazon Music, those are the DSPs that are going to pay mechanicals to the MLC. The MLC will pay their mechanicals to you. So you can sign up on Harry Fox so that when, if Brie, if you write a song, you put on Harry Fox, I want to record it. I go get a mechanical from Harry Fox. That's a very common way to do it. But me getting a mechanical to record your song is different than the DSPs paying mechanicals for the performance of your song over the year. Right. Yeah. And I, I actually literally didn't even think about, oh, the mechanical of me recording my own song. <laughs> it's, Which... So it's funny because when we sign a record deal, this happens, right? So if you write a song and I'm a record label, okay, you wrote the song, you recorded it, but you're giving me you those sound recordings, those masters, I'm going to go distribute your record. I'm making mechanical repro every time I print a CD, every time I stream your music as your record label, I'm mechanically, I owe you a mechanical royalty. So if you're looking at a record deal, you'll see whether, how much does the label have to pay you? Is it the full mechanical royalty? Is it 75% of the mechanical royalty? Are you giving your label a free mechanical license? So so even though this is mandated by law, they can get out of it by putting it into the contract? We can contract around laws all oh. the time. Oh, you don't have to. This is a negotiating point. Right. right. So like I said, these contracts can be negotiated. This is the confusing stuff that when, yes, if you're an artist without a law degree, it can be, you're reading a record deal. You're like, what is this about mechanicals? So it'll say gratis mechanical license. That means free. Mm-hmm. Beware of that because you're giving your label a free mechanical license. Right. And that could be an exchange for them, you know, oh, actually sure. doing the production of the thing. All sorts of things that they, they could be doing. Uh, may, hopefully they're giving you an advance. Mm-hmm. I mean, hopefully they're spending lots of money on marketing and promotions. Hopefully all sorts of things labels do for us. Just mechanical royalties is one of the things they can contract out of. Right. But this would be good to look at, especially for indie labels, because indie labels a lot of times don't give you nearly as much you know, mm-hmm. as far as an advance mm-hmm. or whatever. And if they're also not paying you the mechanical, you got to make sure that you're getting something in return for that. Agreed. It's, uh, there's a lot of those deal points to look at uh, and the, the percentage of your royalty and what the, um, what the recoupment structure is. I mean, the label, label deals, um, there's so many different ways we structure deals these days. It's funny because in, in, I would say the old days, which is not that long ago, there were kind of, there were, there was the traditional uh, uh, label structure that didn't vary very much because there were a few majors and that was the way we did things. Now anybody can start a label. There's Mm -hmm. millions, probably millions of labels out there. And I see all sorts of different types of deals and help write those deals for people. Um, And there's a lot of, a lot of more artist friendly deals and some that are not so much. Well, let me ask you this about labels, because I get this question all the time. Artists think that they should start their own label because that's somehow going to make mm. them more legit. 
And I usually tell them, well, there's really no reason to start your own label unless you're going to be bringing other people on under you. Um, am I correct in that? Or do you have any reason that they should start their own label? I guess it, it depends on what we mean by starting a label. Mm -hmm. Because here's the thing. If you, are, if you write and record your music and you sign up on TuneCore, DistroKid, CD Baby, and you get your music up on the DSPs, you're a label. I mean, you just that basically you just published right? your music. Yeah, right? so you're, you you're your own distributor. You can say, uh -huh. Right, you can say, I've got Sunny Day Records. Now, however, if we go start a company, like an LLC or a corporation, Sunny Day Records, and we get a bank account, and we you know, register, and we start, then we have a label. And then, as you said, we're signing other people to our label. We're distributing other people's music. We definitely need contracts for that. So I think it really... It depends what we mean by starting a label. And that I think is the answer to the question is, what do you mean by that? And then we can tell you whether it's worthwhile. Oh, I'm glad you said that. Cause I think that artists tend to, especially ones that are beginning, they think that having a quote label is going to make them more legit. I know I thought, mm. this. I mean, this was way mm -hmm. back in the early two thousands too, when labels were more legit than they are now. Um, <laughs> when you and, can just start a label on your laptop. And right. You right. And yeah. so, you know, but then they're like, you know, I need to create this whole LLC and all that stuff. Like you said, a lot of expenses around it. And really, what is that for? Mm -hmm. um, you could create a company around your music without having a, a quote label, right? You know, I could be mm -hmm. Brie Noble mm -hmm. Music Incorporated and have an LLC and all of that and not have a label, but still be legit and still be collecting, you know, and, and taking advantage of all those tax opportunities. <laughs> Sure. And the thing is, you could have Brie Noble Music uh, as your company and your company could function as your label mm -hmm. and also as your performing as, as, as your performing company for doing gigs and also as your publishing company yep. uh, and your merch company. I mean, as artists grow, we separate the merch company and the touring company and the label. We start to do that. But to start off, a lot of times we'll put it all under one roof just in the initial stages until we grow to a point where we want to break it out into separate companies. Yep. That's yeah. I'm, so I'm glad we talked about that. Cause I do get that question a lot. Um, let's yeah. go back to the CD baby pro example, because okay. I, this is again, like a, something I get a lot of questions about. Sure. So if they are to check that box and say, I want to be part of CD baby publishing, what does that mean for them? So I'm sorry that I don't remember. I haven't looked at that agreement in a while. So I don't remember it off the top of my head. I mean, again, what I do know is that you're basically granting CD Baby or asking, yes, granting CD Baby the right to collect your publishing revenue. Um, and that means that, for example, when you sign up with your PRO, we split our, our rights into the writer's share and the publisher's share. Right? We split that those, those publishing rights in half, basically, that the publisher's share was going to start going to CD Baby because they're acting as your publisher. Um, so that's one thing. It really, again, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything that I'm not certain of. Right, so I'm of happy to review, <laughs> review their, the CD Baby Pro agreement and come back and chat with you again. Uh, but I don't remember it, all the details. Well, and I think the whole point of it is, okay, then they are supposed to be operating as your publisher and they're supposedly Correct. going to go out and get you opportunities, right? That's why. No, you that's give up. the difference. Yeah. That's okay. the difference. So the, I'm happy you raised that. So okay. you're absolutely right. When I, when I, uh, I, I teach, uh, and so when I'm teaching about uh, publishing rights, we'll say, yes, what is a publisher's job? A publisher's job is to go and find opportunities to uh, use the music. I won't say uh, that, that we're going to find opportunities to make money off the music. Mm -hmm. That could be sync opportunities. That could be uh, re-record opportunities uh, like covers. Um, but, and then that will generate more revenue for them. They take a cut, they pay you your cut. The difference with, a, with something like a CD Baby Pro is generally, in my experience, I could be wrong. There could be programs I haven't been involved in. But generally, they're not aggressively shopping your music. They're not trying to make money off your music. They're collecting the money that is being made from your music. So this is the difference between a publishing administrator and a publishing company or a publisher. A publishing administrator administers the rights, which basically means 
they collect the money, they take a cut, they pay you the rest. A publisher or a publishing company should be doing that, that, uh, that work to help you make money off the music, to help find opportunities for the music, to shop your music. And that I think is, and, and they take a higher percentage for that. They will take more money because they're doing more than just administering the rights. Right. And I'd have to go look at it again, but I do believe they have both of those options. So I okay. believe you okay. can have them be your administrator. They might even work through Song Trust. And then you can also take the extra layer of, I want them to be my publisher and they're going to look for opportunities for me. And they, I have heard them talk about on their podcast that they do look for opportunities for the people that sign up for that. So, you know, the question is, if you've been doing that for a year and you've seen nothing from it, you probably don't want to keep doing that because then you're giving them, you know, money from the things that, because you're signing off your whole catalog that you have with them. So then you're giving them money from the things that you've gone out there and, you know, gotten done with your stuff. Right, right. They're getting paid for the work that you did. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so that's good. I mean, you guys read the agreement for sure. Um, but I just wanted to bring up all those things to keep in your mind when you're deciding whether you're going to going to sign for something like that, because that it kind of takes you by surprise when you're like putting your music in there, you're going to release a new album. And then all of a sudden you've got all these options that are coming up in front of you that you need to make decisions on quickly. And you're yep. like, shoot, I don't know. What does this mean? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is that is a tough situation. I agree, and that's, I, I, and honestly, that is where we're always just encouraging folks to not sign things that we don't understand, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I think that's just the kind of bare bones of it, and and we help. I mean, that that's kind of our job at our free, as as attorneys is to help make sense of those things and advise on what it means and whether it's a good fit. Yep, for sure. Uh, okay, so let's talk about copyright because here's another thing that I get a ton of questions about. Um, okay. When is it important to copyright your music? I hear everything from, you know, the second you write the song, immediately copyright it because someone might steal it to plenty of people that are out there licensing their music and they don't ever copyright or they don't copyright it until it's actually been signed by someone signed by a publisher or signed for a sync deal. So what is your feeling on this? So one thing to clarify is that a copyright exists as soon as we create the work. We say as soon as we lift our pen from the paper. So you actually own the copyright before you, whether or not you register it. Uh, So we do have a registration system in the U.S., through the US Copyright Office, where you can then go register those copyrights that you created, that you already own. Uh, But we have a registration system because a registration is the legal proof of your copyright ownership. And where that comes in, at least from a lawyer's perspective, is if you ever needed to file a lawsuit for infringement of your copyright, so if somebody steals your work, you need to have a registration in order to file that lawsuit. So you, and really, so when people say, when to answer the question of when, my general feeling on it is when you're going to release the music, it's not likely someone's going to steal your music if no one's ever heard it, right? It's when you write a song and it sits in the drawer or sits on your phone and never goes anywhere, pretty unlikely that somebody can infringe it because no one's ever heard it. But once you're releasing the music, that opens the door to possible infringement. So that is, I think, a good time to put in a registration application. The other thing to keep in mind, however, is that the copyright registration process takes a long time. It lengthened due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So while pre-pandemic, we were getting registrations in four to six months, now I don't know what the copyright office is publicizing as their timeline. I'm seeing 12 or 18 months. Wow. Uh, And so it's good to think ahead about these things. Now, when you submit a registration application, the registration you get will be effective as of the Mm -hmm. date you submitted it. So if I submit it today and I don't get it till next year, my registration is still effective as of today. But when am I going to need that registration? It might be sooner. There is, I will mention, there is uh, the option of paying for what they call expedited service at the copyright office. So you can get it turned around in about a week, but that expedited service is an extra $800. Ooh, hello. 
Yeah. So add that to your recording budget. So I do think it's worthy, worthwhile to register all the music we're going to release. One of There are some tricky steps to the registration process because you cannot register. Some clients will say to me, oh, well, I'm just going to go register all the music I've done in the past five years. But you can't do that under one application. Each application has to be for a... Um, basically a unit. So it's something that was sold or, or offered or published as a unit. So an album can be under one registration. One song can be under one registration, but a bunch of music that you've written over the past five years isn't a unit. It's not, wasn't sold or published together. So it can't all be on one registration. I wonder if they're going to change this now that most people are releasing singles, you know what I mean? Cause it gets to be so expensive. Yeah. Of course, it's you can take all the singles you release and then put them into an album at the end. But then, you know, you're putting them out there one by one before you've copywritten them then if you're waiting. But you can register before you release. Okay. You can register as what's called an unpublished work. So you could register the whole album and then release them one at a time. But you register as unpublished, which actually is an easier process mm. because the when you do a registration you have to give the copyright office a copy of what you're registering what we call the deposit copy um and if you have the, well the deposit copy has to be what they consider the best edition of your work if you physically print any cds vinyl anything like that they consider the physical to be the best edition so you have to send them two copies of the vinyl but if you register as unpublished before you printed any vinyl, you can just upload your files, mm -hmm. not have to send them anything. So little tricks like that, are the, because this is what we do every day, not stuff that I would expect people to know. And, you know, I will also say, Brie, there is so much information out on the internet, um, but it's, it's, it's not all in one place. Yep. It's also not all correct, right? Like the, the internet is a beautiful, wonderful, horrible thing that has lots of good information and some very, very bad information. So it's kind of hard to find it all in one place, but these are the tr kind of tricks of the trade we learn just by doing it every day. Yeah, so if you if you register as unpublished, once you publish, do you have to register again, like as no. published? You do not. Yay. Yeah, yeah. I like that trick. That's a you great can, one. you can, but if you haven't changed the music, the music that you registered as unpublished is already protected after you publish. Right. You really wouldn't need to. Correct. Yeah. And that, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that's exactly what I tell my students to do in my Rock Your Next Release course. I say like, you know, as soon as you get your master's and before you start releasing your first single, it's time to send all of it in. You know, if they're doing mm -hmm. an EP or they're doing a, a full album, send all of it in for copyright now. So you can mm -hmm. feel fine about releasing your singles up to your full album release because you've got it all registered. I agree. Cool. Now, maybe you can explain the difference between, because there are two kinds of copyright too. There's the, the R and the W, mm -hmm. is that right? Like the written and the recording. So the, so the SR is the sound recording. Mm -hmm. The PA is the performing oh, arts. Thank you. So, well, who, why would you, yeah. So here's <laughs> the thing. Um, I'm not saying it makes sense. This is just what it is. So we have those two copyrights, right? In the, in the composition and the sound recording. And you can register them separately. In the example, you write, you write the song, you own the composition, you go register it. I make the sound recording. I own the sound recording. I go register it. However, if you put them, if you own both of them, and you have to, and you have to solely own both of them. So let's say you have an EP. If you solely wrote all the songs and you solely, so you solely own all the compositions and you solely own all of the sound recordings, you can register both copyrights on one SR application. Okay. However, if you co-wrote some, or you've got some other people, you've got a producer who's got some ownership in your sound recording or something, they won't let you group things if the, if the ownership isn't the same in all the things that you group together. The other thing I will mention, just to complicate it further, is there is a new thing they added called the GRAM, G-R-A-M, 
Oh, what does it stand for? It's the group recording of uh, something music. It's basically for, re- for registering an album. Mm. So you can use the Gram application now uh, as well. There are tricks to that too. There are certain things you're allowed to do and not allowed to do, but that is a new thing they added recently. So if you have multiple people, multiple, I think it's more often writers, right? You have, you have like col- different collaborators on each song. Mm-hmm. And you use the gram. Yes. Okay. The gram allows for that. The group, yes. The um, uh, using a tradi- just a PA will not allow for that. And the other thing I want to make sure to mention, because you're right, it's very common that we have uh, co-writing going on. One thing people fail to think about sometimes is that when we create a sound recording, when we create any copyrighted work, whoever has contributed to the creation of the copyright work is a co-owner of that work. And that sounds pretty intuitive. You and I write a song together. You and I co-own the copyright of that composition. Mm -hmm. However, you and I go into the studio and we hire a couple, we hire a horn section or we hire some backup singers. They're contributing to the creation of that sound recording copyright. They are going to be co-owners of the copyright in that sound recording unless they sign something saying they're giving up their rights. And no one likes to walk in the studio with a piece of paper saying, hey, great to see you, sign this. But honestly, we have to, because the only way copyright can be transferred is in writing. We can't, no handshake deals for changing ownership of copyright. So when you have someone, and look, if someone's top lining, I mean, whatever it is, then someone's contributing to the creation of your copyright. You want to make sure you're thinking about who owns what. If I want to own everything, everybody has to sign their rights over to me. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's another thing that I go over in my course and give them you know, links to some contracts they can use because mm-hmm. certainly when you're new, I certainly didn't know that. Um, and luckily my producer said like, hey, you know, if we're going to have this uh, you know, soloist play on the saxophone player or whatever, you know, you need to have them sign this agreement. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. He told me that. Um, <laughs> honestly, I probably didn't have everybody sign it, which I should, cause I had my own band at that time, but like, it was still my music and stuff. And I'm not sure I had them all sign a contract. Um, mm. And so, yeah, there, there are so many things to think about when you're going in the studio and, and you also have to have your, your producer, sign it and your engineer, right? Because then they could claim part of the, the sound recording. Yeah, most important for the producer um, because the producer is much more likely to contribute mm-hmm. meaningfully, right, to the creation. Right. Nothing against engineers, um, but their, their contribution isn't necessarily as material. Um, but producer agreements are really important, uh, not only for the rights ownership, but also for what's the financial arrangement. They're getting a flat fee. Are they getting any points? Um, you know, there's there we can put a re-recording restriction. So there's a lot of things that can go into a producer agreement as well to help protect your investment in those recordings. Mm, yep, all really, really important important points. Oh <laughs> my goodness, this has been so good. So, is there anything that you think uh, legally that these musicians, these indie musicians that are listening, need to know that we have not covered? There's probably a lot, but obviously like <laughs> we I mean, yeah, I teach entertainment law at the law school. We can talk about this all day, all semester. <laughs> uh, but uh, but I would here I think what we haven't talked about that I think is important to this conversation is just the because some people ask you when do I do a copyright registration? People ask me, when do I hire a lawyer? And mm-hmm. it's challenging because as you said, it can be very expensive and that can be really prohibitive. But I would encourage folks to to talk to an attorney if if you think you might need that help. Because most, I mean, for example, we will always do a free consultation for anybody. We don't expect anyone to pay us until they decide to hire us. But having the opportunity to to go over these things when you are offered a contract or you do feel like the band is really gelled and we need a band agreement. Um, or you do have questions about how to do a copyright registration. And while I think it's very important to work with an attorney at that point, also contracts don't have to be confusing. 
I'm always going to encourage anyone to have a contract with the folks they're working with. Like you said, with you bringing people in the studio, have something in writing. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be full of legalese. It just has to be clear and explicit and unambiguous. And basically you have to know what we're agreeing to. So honestly, in, in law school, in your contracts course, you would learn that there was a, a case hundreds of years ago where they had people wrote out a contract on a bar napkin and that contract was enforceable. It does, I'm not encouraging anyone to write contracts on bar napkins. <laughs> But you can, you can just do deal points, just like, okay, this is what we agreed to. Have a split sheet. So when you are co-writing with people, just say name of the song, name of each co-writer, what are our percentages? Everybody signs it. Just put things in writing because our memories fade or change uh, and <laughs> oral agreements don't always go very well. So don't be afraid of the legal stuff. Reach out to an attorney. Um, or, 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 or write a simple contract, uh, see what you can find online, be careful with, with what you find online, um, but just don't ignore this stuff. Don't just try and sweep it under the rug. It's worth it to pay attention to it. It'll pay you back in the long run. Yeah, and I think one big thing is um, not to feel like asking people to sign contracts is like annoying or making them exactly it's actually it protects everybody feel very comfortable that you're like mm -hmm. professional and you're wanting to mm -hmm. protect everyone's rights it protects everybody and and i also i think that that you know we kind of say how how good fences make good neighbors well good contracts make for good deals for good partnerships for good working relationships because it's all there and then we don't have to worry about it anymore. that's right that's right. Yeah. There's never any ambiguity or, you know, wondering if maybe, you know, they interpreted something differently than you did. No, it's all in writing. This is how it is. Um, okay. I have a few more questions that came to mind. I hope you don't mind. Sure. Since we, of course not. Um, got to this point. So one big thing that people ask me about is whether they should be, you know, whether they should start a publishing company. So you know, mm -hmm. I always explain to them, like, as, as a writer, like you own your publishing Mm -hmm. you know, unless you give it away to someone else, mm -hmm. but they're always uh, wanting to start their own publishing company and register as a publishing company with the PRO because mm -hmm. they think somehow that that is better for them. So I would love to hear your opinion on that. Well, it's one of the things that motivates that is it may have been a long time ago, but if you remember when you sign up for your PRO, if you are self-published, if you don't have a publishing company, you still need a writer's account and a publisher's account mm -hmm. because the PROs split it in half into the writer's share and the publisher's share. Right. Um, so, but that doesn't mean you can, you don't have to actually go form a legal entity like a corporation just to do that publishing account sign up. And I think account. that's what they think because they say Exactly. Yeah. Yes, right, right. But as we were saying earlier, a publisher, especially for an indie musician, a publisher's most important job is to collect those revenue streams. And if you just forming a company doesn't allow you to suddenly go sign up with YouTube to collect publishing revenue, right? And so that's where the administrators are much more efficient and effective because they have those relationships, they have those revenue collection functions already set up. So I think that um, you don't need to form a publishing company just to have a publisher's account with your PRO. You can use a name of a publishing company. You can use a name, but again, as we said earlier, you can have one company that functions as your, your music company for your music, can collect your publishing revenue, can collect from DistroKid or TuneCore, um, can collect for when you play gigs. That could all be under one roof to start off. Um, so starting a publishing company is a much bigger endeavor than just signing up for a publisher's account with a PRO. Yeah. Yeah. And a really pretty much unnecessary, just like the label thing, unless you're going to be a publisher for other people, but then you're going to have to figure out how to collect and you're going to have to, you know, do a whole bunch of footwork to try to get their music, you know, in sync or whatever, just like you're doing yours. If you're going to do that, then form a publishing company. <laughs> right. right. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. And then I think the thing is, there's so many things as far as kind of your checklist of things to do. There's a lot of things to do before we get to forming public. And we haven't even talked about sound exchange. 
Oh, you're right. right? We need to talk about that. <laughs> okay. Oh gosh, there's so many, right? <laughs> well, it's it's pretty simple. I mean, well, maybe not simple, but in the same way that the PROs are collecting for the public performance of your compositions, your publishing rights, Sound Exchange in the U.S. collects for the public performance of your sound recordings of your masters. So every time, so every time you release a master, you want to you want to register it with Sound Exchange because they're going to collect the performance royalty for when your your master, when your sound recording is played on uh, on any of the DSPs or anywhere on the internet, actually. Right. So if you don't register with Sound Exchange, you're not getting paid for people. So if 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 someone's listening to my song on Spotify, mm -hmm. you know, 20,000 streams, mm -hmm. if I don't register with sound exchange, I am not getting paid for that, that sound recording, um, you know, use, correct. Right. The performance okay. Spotify will pay you the, the pennies that they do. Right. Uh, but sound sound exchange is a different revenue stream. Again, splitting these things up as we do. Um, so you're, you're, you're leaving money on the table and it may not be a ton of money until your 20,000 streams become 20 million streams, but it is still money. It is still another revenue stream that is worth registering and collecting. And can you sign up for Sound Exchange today and collect anything from the past? Because I know you can with the MLC because they've and been And they collecting. do this as well. Okay. Yes, and Sound Exchange does the same thing. That's correct. Okay. So yes, so it's not Register too late, you guys. PRO. Go sign up. <laughs> no, do yeah, exactly. It's never too late. Register with the PRO. Register with the MLC. Register with Sound Exchange. It sounds like a lot, but once it's done, they just are supposed. They should be sending you checks. Right. And then the last thing I wanted money. to to cover was the the foreign, mm -hmm. you know, neighboring rights, like foreign income. Of a lot of us have our music is being especially if we're on DSPs that are popular in yep. other countries, it's being played other places. And how do we collect those monies? Your US PRO has relationships with the foreign PROs. So, it so your US PRO should be collecting your worldwide royalties for all the performances in all the countries that they represent or they have relationships with. Um, and, it, and, and that goes both ways. If you're, in a, if you're outside the US, your PRO in your home country should have relationships with the U.S. PROs so that the U.S. performance money is going to you internationally. Okay. Now, what about the monies that are through like sound exchange? Do they, do they do outside or just U.S. monies? Same. Should be the same. Okay. So we don't have to register with anything else. Hopefully, if we've got those, let's see, is that three? Big three? <laughs> yes, your PRO, the MLC, and Sound Exchange are good ones that we can rattle off very easily. <laughs> and then you want to have a, a, a publishing administrator, like, like a song trust or something like that. Correct. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay. I feel like we just boiled all of that. I hate, I feel like we just gave everybody a, a list of things to do. They didn't, they didn't listen in today to be told what to do, but. Oh yes, it's... they did. They listened to my <laughs> podcast. They know I'm going to give them action steps. So I just gave you guys your Good. action steps for the day. Good. Great. Uh, I, I'm happy to help. <laughs> awesome. So I, I love how you're, you're, you're really boiling it down to something that I can understand and also you know not making us feel like idiots for not getting it because oh, it's no. a lot like it's it's, it's, confusing. it's confusing this is like i've been doing this just like you i've been doing this a very long time uh <laughs> it didn't all i didn't just wake up knowing this stuff and and again i learned it i learned it because i didn't know it when i was on the music side before i went to the law side it's very confusing and part of the things i do as an attorney Yes, I'm helping with contracts and with copyright registration, but also helping people navigate the music industry. This stuff is confusing. And, and answering those questions can really is, is part of, you know, I think anyway, is part of my job. Oh, well, we appreciate you for it. So I know you're based in Colorado. Do you have, uh, or do you work with clients all over the U.S.? All over the place. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. We so do. So, yes. Yeah, so. How can our people get in touch with you if they like your uh, every man brand of, of entertainment <laughs> law? <laughs> I appreciate that, Brie. Well, so our firm is Creative Law Network. So it's creativelawnetwork.com. 
and we're on all the socials as well. Uh, but you can just reach out. I mean, it really is uh, what, again, what we do is just help artists uh, with the legal so they can focus on the art. So send me an email, give us a phone call, send us a note on the website through the socials, and we'll find a time to connect and answer any questions you have. But Creative Law Network is definitely the way to find me. And I'd love to hear from, from folks who have listened in today. Awesome. Thank you so much. I so appreciate talking through all this complicated stuff and, and boiling it down to something that people can really go out and take action on today. Well, thank you for having me. It's great chatting with you. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.